Aloha everyone, this is June 10th and 11th from the 2018 Kilauea eruption. Let's get into it. We begin June 10th back in Leilani Estates at the eruptive vent of Fisher 8. Not much has really changed. The output remains extremely high. The USGS has even detected an increase in the SO2 emissions, suggesting an even higher volume of flow coming out of the Fisher 8 vent. The thing about it is, is the height of the fountain is not quite as tall as it was previously. Here we have another funnel cloud on the backside of Fisher 8. These are relatively common but hard to capture just because of the speed in which they form and then dissipate. But Fisher 8, you can see all that SO2 being emitted from it. Overnight, there was an overflow of the channel walls near the Puna Geothermal Venture. Now, lava came up over the embankment and down the levees into the area that had yet to be covered by lava where it started a small brush fire. Now these overflows are quite common as we've discussed previously and they don't tend to start that big a fire at least at this point in the eruption. We're still pretty early on. Things are going to get continuously baked in the SO2 and other emissions from the lava channel and from the vents themselves. So things are only going to get drier progressively from here. Moving down the lava channel a little bit further, we get to the braided section. This braided section is one of the few points in the entire seven mile long lava channel where the channel splits from one primary channel into two separate channels that run parallel with each other before reconjoining a little bit further down slope. This area is characterized with a bunch of different overflows, which are shown with the lighter gray contrasted against the dark black of the older lava flows and this channel is going to become a little more volatile in this area as we progress through the eruption back up at the y of highway 132 and poiki road we look at the overflow that we saw on june 9th the one that had started a small brush fire in the sugarcane grass and that has essentially just died off without really any intervention. And the uh, overflows are continuing though. There's more overflows and there's going to continue to be overflows. The channel is still evolving and getting more robust with each one. Well, I'm on the boat right now. This is my view. I'm getting into Hilo. Just getting back to Hilo. Laid down and she snatched him up. Right on. And he's a good boy. So our rescuers for the week weekend. <laughs> the animal rescue operations are continuing in full swing. There's many volunteers that are dedicating their time to going into the isolated and inundated areas to try and rescue the animals that have been left behind. Now there's so many animals out there, primarily due to the fact that the animals weren't evacuated in the days leading up to the lava flow and then when the lava start to move into those subdivisions they were still there so people went into those areas door to door and let off every animal that they could to run free to get away from the lava here we have the latest thermal map produced by the usgs on june 10th showing the lava flow from fisher aid all the way down to the ocean entry and not really much has changed in the past 24 48 hours the lava flow is still primarily making the ocean entry on the southern part of the ever-expanding lava delta. We step into June 11th, back up at Fisher 8. There hasn't really been any changes overnight. There has been a decrease in the height of the fountains over the previous days. It's now around 130 to 180 feet tall. But also there's the emergence of three distinct fountains within Fisher 8 that are starting to become more identifiable. And these fountains, though, aren't as high as some of the fountains we've seen over the previous week, the volume, if anything, has increased. Fountain height is really a poor indicator of the volume coming out of one of these vents. And the eruption of Fisher 8 is really gonna showcase that well. Moving further down the lava channel again to the braided section that we previously discussed, there was one thing though I didn't get to talk about. And that is that there's slightly different characteristics in the lava flows that we're seeing throughout the 2018 eruption and those that are taking place over the channel walls, these overflow areas. So the vast majority of the eruption is a uh -uh lava. This is very rough, fast moving lava flows that 
are more prone to high flow volumes and steeper areas. These overflows, though, are more pohoi hoi. They're smooth and ropey lava flows that are really brittle. We get this shell pohoi hoi. It's this very thin layer of pohoi hoi that is hollow inside. So if you step on it, you'll fall through a couple inches to a couple feet. Moving all the way down to the ocean entry near Kapoho, we see that the interaction between the lava and the ocean is rather explosive. These littoral explosions are common and while they're happening, they're also creating a bunch of tephra and ultimately sand. We'll see sand start to dominate the southernmost shorelines immediately adjacent to the ocean entry point. And this was common throughout the Pu'u'u'u days where sand would collect near these ocean entries. And that's just a byproduct of this interaction between the hot lava and the cool ocean. That'll do it for June 10th and 11th from the 2018 eruption. The next episode, I'm gonna be looking to combine more days into a single episode as the eruption at this point is rather consistent. There isn't much deviation day to day as there was in phase one and two of the eruption. So I hope to see you there. Until then, aloha.